Welcome back to Icon, everyone. Today we are talking about The Ultimate Doom, another three-part story arc, so buckle up. It's going to be an extra long episode. It begins in India or some other South Asian country where they have white people in turbans. This guy is the Maharaja and has installed solar panels for renewable energy for his people, so he's not bad. A power source means Decepticons show up, so that is bad news. Fortunately, the Autobots were a quick drive away, you know, because they have built-in water skis now, so they can just casually cross the ocean. The entire ocean. They engage the Decepticons and trash the Maharaja's palace, but that's okay because he has no bearing on the story here at all. With Prime and some other Autobots busy, Megatron starts Operation Waste of Manpower. The Soundwave sends in the usual suspects straight into the Autobots' base. Rumble starts an earthquake, shaking up the Autobots and causing them to search for the source. Ravage jumps out and goes rah rah and attacks. Laserbeak swoops in to steal Sparkplug. Megatron orders everyone back to the base because it turns out that's all they wanted. Wow. That's a lot of effort just to grab and run off with Sparkplug. I mean, to start a battle on the other side of the world, start an earthquake, and go deep into the heart of the Autobot base just to yank him out seems like a lot of wasted energy and a high chance of failure. Why not try Operation Wait Until Spark Plug Goes Out for Groceries and grab him then? Though I suppose since the Autobots still haven't put up the chicken wire to keep Laserbeak out, maybe this really is the least safe place for Spark Plug to be. Starscream feels that Megatron's plan of having them attack the temple was a huge waste of energy, and Thundercracker disagrees. I personally think Starscream is right, since again, all they wanted to do was kidnap Spark Plug. They do that basically every other week. Main difference is this time is that they didn't get Spike too. Megatron has made a new friend, a mad scientist human named Dr. Wily, I think. And this guy has made microchips that you can plug onto a human and mind control them. Ah, the old mind controlled insurgent storyline, gotcha. He puts it on Spark Plug, and to prove that he's one of them now, they bring out an Optimus Prime decoy and have Spark Plug flip him over. So, wait, wait, does he have super strength? Or is this double made of cardboard? It's never really answered. So the Autobots are determined to get Spark Plug back, but mostly because they can't stand Spike's incessant whining. They dive down into the water to engage the Decepticons while some Autobots, led by Brawn, because he has a drill apparently, dig under the ocean floor to get to the Decepticon base through the bottom. So wait, the Autobots do know where the Decepticon base is. The whole time I thought they had no idea since they just, you know, didn't do anything about them. The Decepticons are well outnumbered at this point, because the Autobots have Jetfire and the Dinobots. So there's really nothing stopping the Autobots from taking out their base and giving them a significant disadvantage. I honestly believe they could have ended it if they took the initiative. But I guess Optimus is just hoping that Megatron will eventually turn himself in. Deep down inside, I think Megatron knows that his behavior is unacceptable. Anyway, the battle goes about as well as expected. Bots shoot other bots, and Braun digs into the Decepticon base, and they pull out Sparkplug. With Sparkplug rescued, the Autobots get to work fixing each other. But old Sparky is acting weird, not sure which Autobots he's fixing, and being super cool to Spike, whose need for constant validation is on full display here. The Decepticons break in, and everyone wonders why the security systems failed to alert them. I mean, I'm not too surprised personally, they still haven't installed the chicken wire. With the Autobots still faulty from battle, they are easily overpowered. Spike looks over to see what happened to Teletran 1 and sees that it's been tampered with. So he triggers the fire suppression system, which covers the Decepticons in foam. Apparently, this would freeze their systems up if they don't wash it off, so they retreat rather than finishing up the Autobots. I mean, you guys had them right where you wanted them. Can't you just take five minutes to finish the job? Jeez. Also, why would Cybertronians have fire suppressed in foam that freezes up Cybertronians? Like, that just makes no sense. It's like if we filled our sprinkler system with paralyzing agent rather than water. Like, maybe it'll put out the fire, but it also will paralyze you. Why not write a solution that makes sense, like have Spike activate a force field or some auto cannons or something like that? Like, boom, easy fix. Sometimes I feel like this show purposefully takes a more convoluted path when the simpler answer is the better one. Anyway, Sparkplug runs off with the Decepticons and even gives a dramatic line to Spike like, 
Next time we meet, we are enemies. Way to lay it on their thick, Sparkplug. Megatron and Professor Evil Einstein have built up a little army of mind-controlled humans, and they're using them to build three space bridge portals. Megatron has a master plan to create one giant space bridge and send Cybertron all the way into Earth's orbit. The Earth would be ripped to shreds by the gravity, and he plans to harness the energy of the disasters caused by it. The Professor doesn't like this, because he had plans to rule over Earth after the Decepticons finished with their plan, but for some reason after this, he's still going along with Megs' plan? I guess the alternative was getting stepped on, so whatever. The Autobots show up to put a stop to things because that's what they do. Megatron sends his mind-controlled slave army of humans, and the Autobots have to get past them without squishing them. Easier said than done. Sparkplug even attacks Bumblebee, and Spike tries to stop him. He almost gets his dad out of the mind-controlled state, but Dr. Frankenstein turns up the volume on his device, and Sparkplug goes back to hating Spike. He even goes over and activates one of the space bridges. Skywarp activates another, and Megatron goes to activate the third one, but Prime stops him. Megatron says, No problem, you do it. And Prime goes, Okay. And activates the final space bridge, creating a portal large enough to bring all of Cybertron into Earth's orbit. I joke, but only somewhat. Megatron gets Prime to open up the space bridge because if he doesn't, Cybertron will be destroyed. Prime is given a dilemma to trade his homeworld for Earth. With so many more Autobots and Decepticons still on Cybertron, he would essentially be committing genocide of his own people if he didn't press the button. It's actually a pretty powerful moment, or would be if it wasn't rushed to the point where it did basically feel like, you do it. No, you have to. Okay. Shame, really. So Cybertron appears in close orbit, and instantly Earth begins shaking. Prime is already lamenting about his decision. And that is the end of part one. Back to Iacon will return after these messages. We now return to Back to Iacon. Part 2 begins immediately after, with Cybertron's gravitational pull wreaking havoc on Earth, with earthquakes and weather disasters starting immediately. Optimus is like, Well, I think I done did a goof there, Ironhide. Don't worry about it, Prime. We all done did a goof at some point. We just gotta make sure that goof we done did ain't so goof that we can't undid it. What? Everything is affected. The jets can't fly, and the earthquakes make it so Rumble has no more special moves, because there's already an earthquake. Without his ground pound, what's he even got? The only one having any fun right now is Megatron. He tells Soundwave to send out audio disruptor waves that wreak all sorts of havoc. Sending the jets spiraling and the human slaves running away. I'm assuming that this is the name of Starscream's hip-hop demo tape, because I don't know what else would have this kind of effect on its surroundings. This forces the Autobots to retreat, and they need to stay close so not to get lost. So naturally, Bumblebee and Spike get lost. Professor Even Crazier Kramer wants more human slaves, so Megatron sends Laserbeak to retrieve a bunch. He grabs some dudes and then goes after Spike. An earthquake opens the ground, and Spike moves out of the way, but Bumblebee gets trapped between the two sides, and Laserbeak swoops in and takes Spike. Bumblebee falls in, and we can presume that he's dead. Dun, dun, dun. Fortunately for Spike, some Autobots notice that they were missing and blast Laserbeak away, catching Spike. They go to fish Bumblebee out of the crevice too, so that's handy. I guess that uh, shot was only for trailer bait, and he's gonna be okay. Not sure what to do about the disasters that are taking place, Wheeljack sends in the Dinobots to do some damage control. And they actually do a decent job, but you know, even they can only do so much to stop the planet from actually tearing up. The earthquakes shake up the volcano that the Ark is stuck in so much that it's active again, and the Autobots have to evacuate, including Skyfire, who heard that the plot would require him soon, so it was time for him to crawl out of bed. The volcano erupts, blasting out some of the Autobots that didn't make it out, which is definitely plausible. Skyfire catches them to remind the audience why he's useful. Ironhide goes back to the volcano and feels that the best way to calm the volcano down is to blast rocks into it. And it works because the writers weren't ready to let go of the arc just yet. Doesn't he have the ability to shoot coolant or sticky foam out of the gun arm of his? I feel like that may have been a wiser option, but... But what do I know? The base is saved. Hooray! Back at Decepticon HQ, Sparkplug is getting his chip revamped. 
Dr. Archival, oh yeah, that's his real name, by the way, it's Dr. Archival, has made his hypno chip even more powerful. Megatron orders Sparkplug to get some stuff to Cybertron for some reason, so he does. So the Autobots find out about Sparkplug going up to Cybertron because somebody left a copy of the script lying around, and Spike hears them talking about it. He begs Optimus to let him fly up to Cybertron to figure out what's going on with his dad and bring him home. Optimus puts together a strike force of Skyfire, Bumblebee, Wheeljack, Trailbreaker, and Braun to go. Ironhide goes too, but then doesn't and is part of the team on Earth. Skyfire zooms up to Cybertron and everyone on board managed to get past the Decepticon defenses no problem. Once on Cybertron, Spike instantly falls into a trap. Not to be outdone, Bumblebee jumps in right after, followed by Braun. I sure hope this doesn't lead into an incinerator! Luckily it doesn't. It's just a small room that's easy to escape from. Braun opens up the vents and they crawl in. Wait, do robotic life forms require ventilation in their buildings? Hmm. Something to think about. Luckily, the vents do take them to the most plot convenient location, the room where Megatron installed the mind control machine. It tells them everything they need to know about why Sparkplug is acting the way he is, which one might have inferred from him holding his head and groaning before betraying his friends and son for no rational reason. What I guess these guys needed as a tip off would be something along the lines of him going, Ow, my mind is being controlled. What's that, Dad? You think he's hangry? I hear that's a serious human condition. Yeah, you know what? That might not even work. Anyway, Sparkplug enters the room and they hide. Spike leaves his wrench out there for Sparkplug to find, knowing that his emotional connection with that wrench is slightly closer than his emotional connection to his son. Spike then plays peekaboo, and Sparkplug freaks out and presses the alarm to alert the Decepticons. Wah, wah, wah. End of part two. Back to Iacon will return after these messages. We now return to Back to Iacon. Part 3 starts with a lot of moaning and weeping from Spike as he tries to convince his dad that they used to be friends. But he's like, nah dude, I'm a bad boy now. Braun and Bumblebee insist on making tracks, since any minute now the Decepticons are going to crash through that, and oh look, there's Shockwave. They try to escape, but Soundwave is there with a couple of jet fighter goons. Braun suddenly shows that he's made of pretty stern stuff, and takes these nameless goons out and even shoots Soundwave in the chest. He makes a run at Shockwave with a beam, but it gets melted, which puts a stop to his one-man army moment of greatness. It's okay, Braun, you did pretty good, and you did a hell of a lot more than Bumblebee, who went catatonic the moment Shockwave walked in. I actually really like this scene because it shows Shockwave is actually a pretty formidable fighter. Because he's always stationed on Cybertron, we rarely actually get to see him in action. Luckily, the other Autobots charge in to save the day, with Skyfire, in particular, making a case for kids to get his toy. They all make a break for it, and some Seekers chase them, and they make their way to Wheeljack's workshop. Skyfire blasts the Decepticons out of the sky, and, and the Decepticon goons chasing them from the ground just kinda suck, so they lose them. Wheeljack's workshop is full of screens and buttons, so Spike gushes about how awesome it is. I mean, it's okay. But Teletran 1 looks more impressive, in my opinion. Bumblebee gives Wheeljack a copy of Transformers the movie on Laserdisc to watch, but Wheeljack hates that movie for some reason. But it does provide them with a means of disrupting the mind control on Sparkplug. I mean, I might just remove the chip, since it's, like, actually visible? I don't know. Maybe it's too dangerous to just yank it off. Title of their sex tape. The human slaves are building a huge power station with Dr. Archival watching over things. The purpose is to harvest the energy of any incoming tidal waves, one of which is coming soon, with the Autobots riding it because they just watched Point Break and thought it was rad. Dr. Archival wants to clear his slave army out, but they aren't quite done, so Megatron says they'll just have to drown when the tidal wave shows up. Archival doesn't like this because that army was why he agreed to this plan in the first place. On top of that, Starscream is getting pretty snarky at Megatron, who sees some potential problems in the future with all this self-serving he's been doing, so he orders Dr. Archival to not talk to Starscream. And just like when you tell people on the internet not to do something, ordering Archival and Starscream to not do something instantly makes them do the opposite. Anyway, the tidal wave comes and loads a whole bunch of Energon cubes, so Megatron leaves, leaving basically everyone behind. You know, sometimes Megatron is so short-sighted. 
In this scene, he leaves Dr. Arkville behind because he doesn't need him anymore. But in the next scene, he wants to make his slaves go faster. So he's like, where's Dr. Arkville? Um, yeah, you just let him drown because you're too evil to see two steps ahead. Arkville is not dead, though, and Starscream comes out of the water and carries him off. I'm sure that's the start of a beautiful friendship. The Autobots rode the wave to the scene and didn't really plan their next move. And they just kind of crash and get washed up, but that's okay because they're big robots. And they also start saving the drowning humans because they're heroes, and that's what heroes do. Meanwhile, on Cybertron, Whalejack has made a wobbly wobble thing that disrupts the connection between the mind control chip and spark plug. Well, at least they're hoping it will. There always seems to be some question whether or not Wheeljack's inventions will work or not, but they seem to always work to me. I'm guessing that they're really holding the Dinobot incident against them. Is this about the time I almost killed everyone with the giant mindless robot dinosaurs? No. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, no. But the right person to try this device on is Sparkplug. So they head back to Decepticon HQ and try it out. Spike finds him in no time, but Shockwave tells Sparkplug to end Spike right then and there. But the rest of the Autobots come in with the Wooble Wobble, Sparkplug is all better, they beat it out of there and head back to Earth. The Autobots track down Megatron, and he's already complaining that he doesn't have Dr. Archival to help him control his minions. They're ready to strike, except they don't want to blast or smoosh any of the innocent humans. Megatron gets distracted when he hears Starscream giggling in the bushes. Him and Dr. Archival are having a moment. Starscream wants to drain his brain energy for Energon. I wasn't aware that that was a thing that could happen, and I don't know why Starscream decided to bring Dr. Archival all the way to where Megatron was so that he could get caught trying to betray him. It feels like that naughty moment in the bushes could have happened anywhere. Megatron decides enough is enough and plans to blast Starscream, but like what will happen so many times over and over again, something distracts Megatron at the last moment so he doesn't pull the trigger. Starscream takes Archival and books it out of there and the Autobots attack. Aided by the team from Cybertron who are using the Wobbly Wobble things to free the human slaves right then and there. Megatron has enough energon to power up Cybertron, apparently. So he takes off and leaves everyone behind. Again, he's really not playing the long game here by ditching everyone who has ever helped him out. With everyone back on Earth, they figure the best way to knock Cybertron out of Earth's orbit is to knock it with a large energon explosion. Fortunately, Megatron just took off in a ship with a large energon source. So the Autobots open fire and blow his ship up, which throws Cybertron out of orbit. And apparently this new shift in gravity didn't cause a bunch of catastrophes this time, so that's nice. And man, with an explosion that size, that had to have vaporized Megatron for sure. Nah, he's just floating and he's really mad. Even pulling out that line that he will be avenged. Yeah, 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 we've heard it before, pal. The Ultimate Doom is one of those legendary Transformer stories that everyone is like, whoa, remember that time they brought Cybertron into Earth and it was like three-parter and whoa. Because when you're a kid, nothing gets you more hyped than the words to be continued. So I'm going to have to tread lightly here. I wanted to like the Ultimate Doom. I really did. And I really respect the ambition of it and all they wanted to accomplish in this three-parter. But, I, you know, what? I'm just going to... I'm just gonna tear this band-aid off. The Ultimate Doom is really not great. The story is just a mess. The concepts are interesting enough. Megatron has teamed up with a mad scientist who makes him a mind-controlled slave army so they can use the slave labor to build portal large enough to transport Cybertron into Earth's orbit. Then they use the slave army to build machines to harness the energy from the disasters to power up Cybertron. As a concept, I think it's actually really cool, but its very structure undercuts the drama. At the end of the first episode, Cybertron is transported over and the Earth begins to shake and then there are two more episodes. And while the second episode starts with everything being shaken up, the tension doesn't hold. In fact, things are generally pretty calm as that episode winds down and the third one begins. During some of the story, I almost forgot that Cybertron was around Earth. Maybe that's just because it's hard to maintain the kind of literal Earth-shattering stakes for that long. Cybertron's transportation over to Earth seems like a big enough turn that maybe it should have been left for the cliffhanger of the second episode and been shaking things up for the third part. Essentially, they initiated the climax before it was time for the climax. And just like that disappoints the ladies, it disappointed the viewers as well. 
And part of the problem is that Megatron is so dumb, he's so very dumb. I get that he's evil and doesn't mind betraying people when it suits him, but he's constantly turning his back on his own allies before he's even done using them. You know how stupid you sound when one scene you're saying that Dr. Arkaville is no longer of any use to him and then literally the very next scene he's complaining where Dr. Arkaville is? You dumped him, you dumbass. The betrayals don't even carry much weight. Megatron basically tells Dr. Archival that he plans on leaving Earth as a dead husk. And Dr. Archival is like, what? You can't do that. We had an agreement. And then Megatron is like, I am altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Maybe just too obvious, but I make the Star Wars comparison because in Empire Strikes Back, Vader keeps betraying the agreement with Lando. Realizing that Vader's words mean nothing, Lando finally takes a stand and helps free Leia and Chewbacca. Here, there are no consequences. Dr. Archival is mad about it, but he shows no real drive to undermine Megatron. He hums a bit about teaming up with Starscream, and eventually Starscream does take him captive, but that story doesn't go anywhere either. As a note, I do know that this particular story is continued in the next episode, so we'll talk more about that later. I feel like it would have been more poetic if Megatron's betrayal of Archival had some bearing on the outcome of the story. Like Archival got the last laugh by helping the Autobots launch Cybertron back to where it belongs. Or have his mind control minions sabotage Megatron's ship at the end. The spark plug in Spike's story is fine in its broad strokes, but the representation of mind control is a bit perplexing. It's the personal stuff that has me scratching my head, where he says things like, when we meet again we'll be enemies, or don't call me that when Spike calls him dad. Things like that sort of imply a swap in personality, not so much being forced to act against their will. It just doesn't ring true to me. Anyway, I'm gonna give The Ultimate Doom 3 out of 5 because at least it was trying. You can really feel it trying. I don't hate everything about this episode and I hate to talk trash about it, but I hope you do see where I'm coming from. I know kids at the time probably felt very much like I did with the Beast Wars episode The Trigger when I first saw it in the 90s. And you may recall, way back in the day when we talked about that two-parter on Beast Wars Wednesday, it wound up being very disappointing to our older selves. But that's okay, because my 10-year-old self doesn't care what my 30-plus self thinks. It was just very special at the time. The ideas here are pretty good. Very ambitious, but, but it would take a pretty intense rewrite for it to feel like the pieces all fit together. And maybe I'll sprinkle in some bonus points for having the Autobots surf into battle for their final stand. That's kind of cool. That just takes a certain willingness to just... Throw your hands up in the air and pull something random off the idea board. Okay, comment section, I'm ready. Let's go.